Welcome back to the show. Check out these headlines. Not only do we have a great chart for you to see that you're going to love to see, we got so much more. Somebody roll that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show. We're going to get to him in a minute, but let's take a look at this real quick here because we're sitting at $2.52 trillion market cap for crypto. The market's up 1.2%, $65,800 plus for Bitcoin, $3,500 plus for Ethereum, $112 billion plus market cap for Tether, and USDC, $32.7 billion plus market cap. XRP, $0.49, up 0.8 on the 24, up 3.1 on the 7-day. We'll keep an eye on it. The range of price very quickly here is ranging between $40 nine and 53 cents we'll keep an eye on it let's get started here now uh this guy here is the head of the ethereum alliance enterprise ethereum alliance the eea and you don't have to hear the whole thing to know that he understands that ethereum alliance costs too much that's what that's that's what he knows and they're still working on it they're still working on it everybody they're still working on it Let's hear from the one and only David Schwartz about what's going to happen to the value of payments and value transfer in this space, much like it did with email communication. This is a great level set. Take a listen. And no matter what, that, that, is, that is a given. Uh, we had a revolution in the physical delivery of goods with the shipping container, which changed globalization, started globalization. We had a revolution in the, develop, in the delivery of information with the Internet. Uh, but what we don't know is what is the TCPIP of money? What is the shipping container of value? We don't know that yet. There's going to be one, though. That is a definite. XRP ledger, maybe? <laughs> and that's going to bring changes. And what I also want to get through is that one of those changes that I foresee and that I think is important is that the size of payments are, are going to shrink, drastically shrink. Many of you people here probably have a job and you probably get paid twice a month or every two weeks. Well, why is that? Um, you probably pay bills once a month. Well, why is that? It's because payments are expensive and clunky. But if payments were cheap and simple, then those frequencies could go up. You, money could be streamed at you while you're working. You could stream money to your landlord to pay for the place where you're staying. Now, I know those sound like those sound dumb, and, and I'll be blunt. Um, yeah, they are. And I'll tell you, like, if we were talking about email in the late 90s and you said to me, like, what are people going to use email for? I probably could not have given you the examples that is on everyone probably here, probably has a cell phone, probably has email on it, and probably has hundreds of messages that look nothing like postal mail or the messaging that existed in the late 90s. None of that could I have predicted. If you'd asked me if the internet had enough bandwidth in the year 2000, I would have said, yeah, it has plenty of bandwidth. Well, could I have imagined Netflix and on-demand video? That's, that's ridiculous, right? Like the cost of bandwidth is too high for that. But the internet drove the cost of bandwidth down to zero. And if the cost of payments go down to zero, the world is going to change. And I'm going to explain some of the ways that I think that's going to change and what that means. And we all know what that means. I tell you, you know, uh, what a great place for us to level set today. That's where I'm at here because this is important. Because here you have the gentleman from the Ethereum Alliance admitting that, you know, the payments are too high. We could save ourselves a couple minutes he takes to say it. But the reality is that's what he admits, and they're still working on getting that down. But then we see evidence. All these years we've been here, we continue to see the evidence. Confidential presentation from BNY Mellon, world's largest custodian of assets with $48 trillion assets under management, highlights Ripple and Stellar as special infrastructure and base protocols, as you can see right here. Now, obviously, in fairness, public blockchain, you see Bitcoin and Ethereum shown here too, right? So don't want to say that it's not there. It's there. And obviously, Ethereum has smart contracts. So let's understand that. But we know we have some major points coming. Ten days from now, stablecoin regulations go into effect in the European Union from the MICA regulations that are going to be put in place. It has already been made clear that USD Tether does not fall under stablecoin definition and regulation under MICA. How do we know that? We know that because Uphold and other exchanges have already said they will be delisting these assets by this date. That's how we know that. 
So it's not a guess. But where are we here in the United States? Because we know that we've had the Fit 21 bill pass the House, but it needs to pass the Senate and then obviously be signed on the president's desk and or the stablecoin bill. We need some form of legislation here. Now, maybe we see a combination of the stablecoin bill and the Fit 21 bill get passed in the Senate, go back to the House, get a quick vote passed there and then get signed by the president and go forward. I don't know. But here's a take from a uh, conference where you hear lawyers, former SEC official Christina Littman, talking about what her thoughts are on the SEC versus Ripple case and this gentleman, uh, Michael Dickey, as well. So take a listen to this. This is very important to hear this. And then their argument that disgorgement isn't warranted because, in fact, nobody lost any money um, on these particular um, purchases of XRP. Um, Following whenever that ruling happens, probably the summer, uh, it's expected that both sides will cross appeal for the items that they lost. And so everybody will once again still be talking about Ripple at our next conference because it will be at the Second Circuit. Maybe we'll have a decision by then, but we'll still be talking about it. Thanks, Mike. I'll, I'll say on the Ripple appeal point, I'll be curious to see whether the parties appeal there. I think there's some speculation that because Judge Rakoff and the Terra opinion explicitly disagreed with, with Judge Torres's logic from the Ripple opinion. And then Coinbase doesn't really address the Ripple opinion as much, but almost, you know, pretty explicitly adopts the Terra logic. Um, I think there's some speculation that the SEC might just let the Ripple opinion stay there as a district court opinion and not risk you know, elevating it to a circuit level where they could potentially elicit bad law when they have otherwise favorable rulings in the aftermath of the ripple litigation. So it'll be interesting to watch after the remedies phase concludes whether whether either party opts to appeal that. It and is then, going to be very interesting, right? So you have one lawyer like this guy, Michael Dickey, saying, no, this thing's going to go on the way I believe that it goes on to the Supreme Court, appeals and then Supreme Court. But we don't know, right? But this is to where the conversation is. And again, former SEC uh, 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 employee or lawyer uh, talking about it. Now, she has no inside knowledge, in all fairness. Mark Fagel, uh, former SEC uh, litigator, or or I'm sorry, not litigator, but SEC employee, also making that statement, Clarity, there as well. But it, very key to, to, to hear these two different takes here. But let's talk about this, because we know Ripple's got a stable coin they're about to launch. This is Robbie Michnick, who spent a little time there at Ripple, too, before going to BlackRock to head up digital assets. You know, he helped put together that uh, XRP calculator, right, to formulate price Uh huh. with Susan Athey. Take a listen to this, because they're breaking down digital asset space into three pillars, crypto, stable coins, and tokenization. Robbie, maybe can you first kind of talk about like what you think about when you hear the word tokenization and, and what that means, and then also kind of discuss the shift in the financial system to being more open to tokenized markets and products. Yeah, well, when we look at the digital asset space broadly, we put it into three pillars from a BlackRock perspective, which is crypto, stable coins, and tokenization. We think all three of those are important. And when you look at what we've done, they, they kind of map uh, across those three. Tokenization is the longest uh, time horizon to real adoption of the three, for sure. And I think there's been some maybe overinflated expectations about how quickly or decisively this trend would play out. We're talking about a major, major transformation potentially of capital markets infrastructure that affects all types of entities across the value chain. That's not gonna come easily or quickly, right? So we're starting to see some development that suggests that um, this is working, that there's client demand, that the utility of being able to hold a TradFi investment exposure in a digital asset wrapper uh, is actually compelling to investors, certainly to some of our clients. But in hindsight, it was kind of always going to be the case, contrary to what some have thought, including myself uh, originally, that uh, before we would move trillions or tens of trillions in assets into this new technology paradigm, that actually first institutions were going to get comfortable with small exposures to crypto itself, understanding wallets and blockchain-based settlement and being comfortable uh, with the risk controls and the infrastructure supporting that. So that's kind of what's happening. You're seeing more institutions get into crypto a little bit, and that I think is helping to pave the way one day for a broad-based transformation in tokenization. Um, and you did mention stablecoins as well, because I, I think of stablecoins as like the original tokenized product, right? And it's, it's tokenizing 
a dollar essentially. Are you seeing interest with stable coins as a means of moving money around or, or is that still a little immature? Certainly, I mean, I mean you could call stable coins tokenized cash, right? We just think it's so important that we made it its own uh, separate pillar. Um, that's been by far the earliest adopted use case of tokenization. Um, you, know, you see about $150 billion in stable coins today, despite the fact that most pay no interest in a reasonably high rate environment, right? And that I think is a very important signal of just how much utility investors, users, et cetera, around the world are seeing in being able to have a dollar in a digital asset format that is global, that can be transferred into real time at near zero cost. And let us understand that stable coins aren't just dollars, ladies and gentlemen. Stable coin can represent commodities like oil, gold, silver, uh, wheat, corn, soybeans, right? And so much more stocks, bonds, derivatives. This is Jeremy Allaire on stable coins here. And he says, I've been building Circle for over 11 years. And at no time have I been more optimistic than right now. Let me cut through all of this. Because I want to highlight right here the one and only. It's Ray Fuentes right here who grabs the article. It hit him the way it did me. Uh, give Ray a follow here. He says, by the end of 2025, stable coins will be legal electronic money, says Jeremy Allaire, almost everywhere, which sets them up to become a larger and larger portion of the 100 plus trillion dollar market for electronic money. Yes. That's Jeremy Allaire. And yes, that is Robbie Michnick from the head of digital assets at BlackRock. Three pillars, stable coins, one of them. Yes, that's right. Ripple's launching and introducing a stable coin, ladies and gentlemen. It is that big. And it's going to be on the XRP ledger and Ethereum. Now, there's not many months left. I mean, we're six months left in the year here. And it's likely that we're going to see this stablecoin launch by the end of this year or sometime this year. I find it amazing timing that that stablecoin is going to launch and in 10 more days, USD Tether doesn't qualify as a stablecoin in 27 nations in the EU. And I would imagine that that's probably going to happen here in the United States too once legislation passes. And wouldn't this be a great way of boxing out a really, truly unregulated digital dollar being sold around the world from the two largest economies, the EU and the United States, making sure that it could never have the level of liquidity ever again that it currently has today at $112 billion plus. I don't know how much of the EU market supports USD Tether market cap, but whatever that number is, in 10 days, it won't be there anymore. Write that down. You want to know how big and absolutely impressive RippleNet and what's going on is? Everyone talks about BRICS Coalition, BRICS Coalition, they're building their own payment system. Yes, they are. But remember the connections as you look at this, all tied to Ripple. SBI, Ripple, HSBC, Ripple, Onafreak, MFS Africa, Ripple, Banco Brazil, Ripple. This, look, the Ripple logo was placed over this from the, uh, and I'll just show you so you understand. The BRICS wholesale payment does not have that in the diagram, but it's done for the effect to let you know about the relationships. That's why XRP Drops did that this way. So you could see the relationships. We know that there was a document done where Russia's clearly aware of the benefits of Ripple and XRP. Done way back years and years and years ago. But we definitely know that there are ties here. Atal, Banco de Brazil, right? It's SBI, HSBC, and the rest of the players here that you can see on here. There are connections inside the BRICS coalition here. So whether it's direct or indirect, Ripple will be serving a role inside this system, understanding that Ripple has the access to one of the things they use, known as the XRP ledger. It also obviously shows you the, the, the obvious scenario of how XRP can serve as a bridge currency between these regions inside of BRICS because they've made it very clear that they don't want our dollar so they could use XRP 
and avoid having U.S. dollars as they see fit. That's where this is going. Well, take a look at this. I told you there was going to be a chart you're going to want to see, and it's right here from Egg Rag Crypto, ladies and gentlemen. It says the XRP quarterly hammer, bullish candle formation. XRP on the three-month time frame has shown two hammer candles before major pumps. April, June of 16, July and September of 2017. And he says right now, XRP needs to close the three-month candle above 55, 58 cents in the next 10 days to form another perfect hammer formation. This will be powerful bullish signal hinting a mega pump just around the corner. If we get hammer two, expect a pump of around 1,700% to $8 starting in July. So starting in next month. It says, if we need hammer one, we may have to wait another six months. But the pump will be epic around 5,500%, taking us to $27. So if we have to wait for another uh, hammer here, then you can see what we got. Uh, look, I got to tell you, eight bucks, 27 bucks. I say bring it on bucks. That's where, that's where I'm at. And I know you guys are too. Listen, we've been at this a long time. But all of the work, all of the paying attention, all of the focusing on the fundamentals are about to reveal to us why we've been here. The question is, is how much will it reveal to us. We don't yet know the answer, right? But that is why we're here. And I don't know about you, but this is a pretty remarkable time for all of us. And I'm excited that we're here together. Keep a very close eye on this candle formation in the next 10 days, ladies and gentlemen. He said, I'm telling you to stay steady because you have no other option or you will regret it for the rest of your life. That's how much Agrad Crypto feels this right now. Hammer two, as you can see right here, a bullish reversal signal and then hang man, hanging man is a bearish reversal signal here. So you can see here, as you saw beforehand, you see this boom, hammer he's showing right here, as you can see, and then this hammer and blah, 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 right? That's where we're at here. So this is getting interesting to watch, ladies and gentlemen. What will we get when we get to here, right? I tell you, I don't know, but this is exciting to watch again. I couldn't be more excited about what I'm doing and where I'm at and who I'm doing it with, which means all of you. And now we're going into the freedom zone. And let me tell you something. You're going to want to go into the freedom zone with us because it's a big one today, ladies and gentlemen, and we will see you inside. You just go to digperspectives.com, click on the freedom zone and come on in. Not financial advice from me or anyone else. All right. Welcome back. Welcome back. 